So this uh, presentation is uh, about fossil shark teeth from the Upper Cretaceous from Hornby Island, British Columbia, Canada. And it's kind of in two parts, uh, kind of an overlapping. The first part is some bit of history with regards to the research um, by Bill Hessen, Kurt Morrison and myself that goes back in time. And then we jump forward to the, the uh, abstract paper that was done recently. Uh, and uh, I'll talk more about that as we go. So it's kind of a, um, a combination of uh, the history, the basically a 25 year history from the day we found the site to the day that they had the final abstract paper. So it's, it's, a, it's quite a story. So um, uh, it's, so it'll, it'll, it'll go across time quite a way. So, but it's kind of personal because it was all, this collection was done by amateur paleontologists uh, over time. Uh, so I'll just get started. Um, so in 1993, um, in 1993, uh, the VIPS was invited to Hornby Island to meet up with Kurt Morrison. And we looked at an outcrop there and, uh, and, th and this is how it all started. We found this outcrop and we all got down on our knees and looked at all this material and started to um, see shark's teeth everywhere. So that's what this is all about. And I'm gonna start first off because a, a little bit of uh, education, a little bit of um, history of uh, the geological history of, of fossil sharks. So of course we have to talk about fish evolution. I'm only gonna talk very briefly about this just to give uh, those that may not understand the evolution of sharks a little bit of a background. So um, vertebrate evolution started in early Cambrian time uh, first vertebrate, vertebrates were fish and all, they all had backbones of cartilage or bone and they all had the characteristics of a brain case or a cranium. And uh, all fish have gills and they're all cold blooded. So this is a kind of the template of all animals moving ahead through time from the Cambrian time. This is how things started and of course I threw uh, Pikea in there uh, just to give everybody an idea. This was the first true chordate with a cartilaginous background. And a lot of uh, uh, paleontologists and scientists feel that this was the first step in the evolutionary process from a chordate or a cartilaginous uh, background, uh, backbone to vertebrate. And, and uh, so I threw that in there just for the history. Um, also, time-wise, this is a good illustration showing the, the evolution of fish and sharks and uh, right through to uh, mammals, etc. cetera. So um, in this illustration, I want you to, to see the arrow, if I can, yeah, right here, the arrow right here. This is the um, evolution of sharks and rays. And they started to evolve in the Devonian time. And of course, before that was the jawless fish that were evolving from the Cambrian that they split off and um, branched off into the other, <laughs> other types of fish, the spiny sharks, the cartilaginous fish, etc., And of course the ray fin fishes that we have today. Uh, that we're quite familiar with. So this is an important timeline for everybody to kind of remember the Devonian is the age of fishes and this is the evolution that moves to sharks. So um, this little arrow up here is important because this is Hornby Island. This is the um, late Cretaceous time that we, uh, where we found our, uh, on Hornby Island where we found the, sh the shark's teeth. So it's quite an evolutionary um, process there to get to where we are, although the sharks didn't change too much over time. And a very short, brief talk about nomenclature. Um, 
all we have to know here is the family, the genus and the species. Um, and if you know that uh, uh, the nomenclature of all animals have this similar nomenclature, um, I'll be talking about uh, new species of sharks that were found. I'll talk about new genus of sharks that were uh, created as well as uh, two new families of sharks, which is shocking in the paleontological world to actually have this type of a find in an area that was probably two areas, I should say, they're probably, you know, 30 feet by 40 feet square. Um, and this is a, the, the type of diversification we have with these shark's teeth. Okay, now where are we? Uh, for those who don't know Hornby Island, um, uh, of course it's off the uh, east coast of Vancouver Island. And the uh, two sites that we're gonna be talking about are Manning Point <coughs> and Collishaw Point. And I know many of you have been to Collishaw Point, but not many have been to Manning Point. And that's a, a spot that we'll be referring to um, in the, uh, as we move along. But this just gives you that kind of the, the geological area that we're in physically. Also uh, to talk about shark's teeth and the, their, where they fit in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the stratigraphy here. Um, this is, uh, uh, I took this little uh, strat stratigraphic chart off of uh, Mustard and, and uh, Katnik, 2011. And uh, it just shows you that, that blue line you see is pretty well where we are collecting. It's the, just between the, the uh, Campanian and the Maastrichtian um, on the line there as where we're, we're finding the shark's teeth. So it's a fairly uh, um, late in the Cretaceous time period, 74 million years. So um, it's in the Northumberland Formation, uh, late Campanian to early Maastrichtian. And these fossil teeth occur in a green, blue, gray shale or a mudstone. And it appears that they've been segregated, which means that they've been somehow uh, washed by either a currents or down a slope because anything that was heavy all got uh, segregated into one uh, bedding plane. And so that was uh, rather convenient for us collecting. So what was the faunal environment like um, with regard to the fossils that we found in this particular bedding plane? Um, we surmised that it was a deeper uh, water shark fauna but with inshore influences because we found fossil seeds and wood. Um, the deeper water indicated by frill sharks, which we know are deep water sharks as well as other uh, deep water squalomorphs, but also associated with, associated with um, inshore fossil material. Uh, some as associated material we found in this dig were mosasaur teeth, lots of fish teeth, bird bones, starfish, bivalves, um, ammonites, gastropods, and echinoderms. So it was anything that was heavy, that was segregated out, uh, was, uh, was uh, found in this one let layer. So we're gonna talk about the 11 families of the shark's teeth that we found. And um, I will, maybe just not read through them now, I'll just, but you can see there's 11, 11 families uh, specifically that we'll be talking about. So site number one, Manning Point, 1993. This place can be found because right in the middle of the spot where we were looking for shark's teeth is a spot called Mushroom Rock. Now, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. I know most of the VIPS people are. But mushroom rock, you can see that mushroom right there. Um, and the shark's teeth are right in here. 
and Betty's Mosasaur was somewhere over here. So this is kind of a, a pretty fun spot to go to. We've always had great success there. And uh, we can call that uh, site one, Manning Point. So we're gonna drop back to 1995. Um, myself, Kurt Morrison and Bill Hessen are, are uh, collecting at Manning Point. And you can see we're leaning on mushroom rock there. So that just gives you uh, time. This is, uh, gosh, when is this? This, go, this is going back to almost 25 years. So please, <laughs> I hate to think about it. Okay, site two was Collishaw. Collishaw Point was uh, the site of the, the most of the shark's teeth that we found. And uh, I must say it was, uh, uh, pretty exciting to dig here. Now, if you can look at this area right here, the line, and this area here, this is the bedding plane, and this is dropping at about 8%, and uh, we were following it down, and on top of that bedding plane was about, about eight inches right here, and that was absolutely chocker block full of um, fossils, all different kinds of fossils. And, and uh, there's over 5,000 fossil shark's teeth taken out of this area, as well as at least 5,000 plus of other fossils. So this is hugely rich. Uh, it's just, there's just no spot like it that I know. As a matter of fact, there's no spot like it on earth. As according to the to the uh, professionals. Now, one of the, the challenges here was that when the tide comes in, our hole filled up with water. So there was at least a foot of water in here every time we would show up. And we spent at least one to two hours every day when we went out to dig to dewater the site. And that means buckets and totes and, and just working like crazy to dewater it. But once we got down to this layer right here, then we could move in. So here's your bedding plane, that line. And here's the depth of the cut that we're down. And, and the reason that we gave up is because the further you go um, to the left, the deeper it gets. And uh, we just basically ran out of energy. And then a few years, because this was over 25 years, the whole thing, a winter, came, winter storms came in and filled it all full of, of shale. So it was, uh, I mean, it could be resurrected, but you need about 20 people out there with shovels to clean it out. Uh, it's quite a job. So this is early days. We uh, extracted about 5,000 shark's teeth. Um, and we and uh, uh, Kurt Morrison did 90% of all the preparation. He's a very, he's a jeweler and, and a really good with the uh, with the microscope and the tweezers and the crazy glue and was able to glue uh, these together. And we worked together on on photography and uh, getting everything ready. This was again 25 years ago. So again, this is, we all have uh, dark hair and no gray hair, but we, there's uh, Bill Hessen on the left. Uh, he was doing all his photography uh, um, through the microscope. And we got some fantastic uh, images um, in high resolution uh, detail. And uh, we were able to uh, ID them. And we spent like I like say two to three or three to four years trying to ID these uh, um, these fossils and basing it on, you know, sharks of the world one and sharks of the world two, these huge volumes of, of uh, sharks uh, reference books. So 25 years later, um, my goodness, that seems like a long time, but uh, Henry Capetta, probably the world's um, best authority on shark's teeth. Um, he's up in his 80s right now. He's, but he was able to 
um, worked with Kurt Morrison uh, closely over a period of at least 15 or 20 years to, to, to get this sorted out. Um, and so basically it's the uh, shark fauna from the Campanian of Hornby Island, British Columbia, Canada. And you can Google that and you can get the whole uh, abstract and read through it. It's the detail in there is to uh, is really, uh, really interesting. What I'm going to be doing is just simply skimming through it. So he's saying this is an insight to the diversity of Cretaceous deep water assemblages. So this site, the fauna consists of 30 shark species. That's unbelievable number of shark species belonging to 26 genera and is characterized by a large number of new uh, lasmobranch taxa, 17 species, 17 new species, seven new genera, two new families. All these principally belong to the uh, usual deep water squalophorphs. And that's um, mostly our deep water. There's a few that are, um, that are, are, are in um, more continental shelf type of fauna. So this is what Mr. Henry Capetta said, the Hornby Island fauna represents by far the most diverse deep water assemblage ever described in the late Cretaceous. So that's pretty, pretty grand statement to make. And uh, here it was just on right here in Hornby Island. Okay, so that was my introduction. <laughs> is everybody still following this? Okay, so we're gonna start off with the first uh, family. And uh, first family, of course, is uh, Clematosodosalaceous, Salaceidae, and that's the uh, frill sharks. Now, probably nobody's heard of a frill shark, but there are frill sharks today and uh, the frill sharks are uh, um, are kind of uh, thought were extinct up until the 19th century, and all of a sudden in Japan, some fishermen were catching these fish, and they said, "Wait a second, this is this is a, a frill shark uh, that we thought was extinct." But they found them in Japan, Spain, and Norway now, so it's a very archaic archaic fish, and it's quite uh, Bizarre. Um, let me just stick something here. So their teeth. Uh, let's move ahead. Their teeth are we call we, we used to call them tridents because they had three cusps. And so um, the, uh, the 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 species that we have here is uh, Dicheus garatha. Garthi, and uh, it's a, a new species to me because I we thought these were a different species altogether for 20 years until I read the paper. <laughs> so it's uh, quite quite interesting how a lot of these with uh, Henry Capetta have was able to really diagnose these teeth really well. So um, they're characterized by a sharp cutting edge on the edge of the tooth. They're not round. Um, they have very smooth laminoid, laminoid uh, on the edges. The cusps are nearly kind of parallel, but some of them are, are, are flayed out. And uh, they have a, a kind of a very similar root system that's just kind of fairly flat, as you can see. Um, these are fairly rare to find. We, I've, I've probably found maybe a dozen, but there's, uh, we found these to be quite a, a rare tooth when, in our in our overall collection. So another Clematis today is a, a really uh, interesting one because it was named after Dr. Rolf Ludvigsen, uh, who lived on Demon Island and and helped out at the beginning uh, by encouraging us to collect fossil, uh, fossil shark's teeth. So um, as you can see, this is a little bit different. They're kind of more 
straight up and down, they're stubby, their roots are, are similar to the previous spe uh, species. But again, they have the uh, serrated, this is the difference, serrated, uh, number two, serrated amyloid. So there's uh, serrations on these, whereas the, the other teeth were, were smooth. And these ones here are a little less divergent. So when we're looking at these characteristics, can you imagine try, us unprofessionals trying to understand what these were? And we had no, there's nobody really in, uh, in, in Canada that, that had any idea about this type of uh, Cretaceous shark's teeth. So we had to really phone, we contacted people in Florida and, in, and, uh, and eventually in France. So, um, and, and we really got, uh, learned quite a bit. Our next uh, um, shark uh, family is the uh, Hexanchidae, and it's the cow sharks. And I think most people are fairly familiar with cow sharks because we have them here in, in the waters off Hornby Island. So just a quick overview: the they have no front dorsal fin here; they have a a, a rear dorsal fin. They're a deep water uh, shark, as you know and their heterodonty or their teeth, they have different teeth up and they have different uh, uppers and different teeth lowers. The saw teeth are the lower ones. And the key thing is they have a uh, very special tooth, a symphysial tooth, which is a very middle tooth in the very front on the bottom. And uh, we were able to find one or two, I was able to find one or two of these, but Kurt found quite a few more. And uh, as you can see, here's uh, uh, this, the first uh, uh, species I'm going to describe here is Hexanchus microdon. Um, upper teeth are different than lower teeth, as you can see. A are the uppers, they're about seven millimeters long, lingual, labial, and lower. Um, and it, the lower teeth are like little saw, saws. And the central tooth is a symphysial tooth about six millimeters long. So these, again, you have to uh, identify all the diagnostic features. And we call this the, the primary cone or the accessory cone decreasing in size to the uh, lesser cones. And there's no mesial cusplets on this. So this is kind of a really easy one to identify. And uh, when we identified it, we identified it correctly from day one. And it was, uh, and they're fairly, a little more plentiful than the other teeth to find. So we're, we're pretty happy to find those. So the other um, species here, if I get my bearings right here, just a second here. So this is, uh, Another uh, uh, cow shark, um, it's a notodanodon pectinatus. Now we misidentified this. We call it uh, notodanodon dentatus. And that was, uh, so we got corrected on this one, but it is an unbelievably fantastic tooth to find. It's quite large. Um, and, uh, they are about 50 millimeters high and they can be 23 millimeters across. Um, and to find one in one piece is really hard um, because they, they do break quite easily. But uh, um, this is a, a, a tooth that we really um, enjoyed finding. Also on the uh, cow sharks, we go from the six gill shark, which was the uh, Hexanchus microdon to the seven gill shark. Now, a um, couple of things to note here on the seven, uh, seven gill shark, of course it's seven gills, um, but they have huge eyes. And this is because they were fairly deep water sharks. And, uh, um, and some of the uh, characteristics of these, and these, six, these seven gill sharks are around today, by the way, and uh, they're on the west 
on the east coast of North America, there's there's fishermen that actually go out and try to catch these. Um, I've seen quite a few. This one here is a, a picture below. I've I've got it. It's just it tells shows this is one of the guys that caught this shark and took a picture of it. So there are sport fishers that fish them. So the difference between these uh, these uh, Heptrancus and the Hexancus, of course, is that uh, that there's this. Uh, they still have the uppers and the lowers fairly similar to the microdon. However, the lowers have a cusplet in front of the primary cusp. And then they have a, a larger primary cusp and then really quite shorter ones after that versus the other one you saw, it kind of had a nice taper all the way down. So that was, so these are also fairly, fairly easy to identify. And the um, synthesial tooth has a large cusp and two small ones on the side. And, and that's different than the other one. So when you go through these diagnostic features, you basically have to make notes and write everything down and then compare it to the, the literature to, um, to understand it. Now, this species here is a protoheptrancus. Um, and it, it is a new species. Um, and uh, so uh, it was named after, I think, Peter, Pete Lowe from Port Alberni who helped on, on some of the digs. Um, so one of the most exciting uh, uh, finds, which um, I didn't realize it until a paper came out, was the, uh, this tooth here, which we didn't identify. Uh, I didn't know didn't know what it was, and so let me just refer to my note here. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's uh, Comox odontidae. Now Comox odontidae is named after the Comox First Nations, so it's it's named in honor of the the people that lived here uh, on this territory. And it's, a, it's not only a new family, well, of course, it's a new family, but it's a new genus, of course, and species. And uh, um, this is pretty special to have, uh, be able to find a new family of sharks. It's really off the scale of, of things. And uh, it's pretty special. So um, the, the, the species is, is or the, the name of it, it's gonna be uh, Comoxodon down below here. Comoxodon um, quagluthicus. I don't think I have the pronunciation of that, but the, the key thing is this word here means shark in in the native in in Coma, in the in the uh, Salish language, and so this is not only a new species, a new genus, as well as a new family. So this is. Um, very important. So some of the characteristics, of course, of this is uh, it's kind of a nondescript type of a shark's tooth, but it has some features. Uh, slightly convex uh, on this side right here, uh, number one. Um, it has enamelloid on the lingual side, uh, has a very sharp cutting edge, and uh, has lateral cusplets. And the root is really fairly flat with two little protuberances right here and right here. So it is very, very identifiable. Uh, so very exciting tooth and uh, what a history it's gonna have uh, um, because it's named after the Comox First Nations here. Okay, so bramble sharks, kind of a, a pretty special shark. I uh, I kind of uh, kind of take a liking to it because it has these special features on it: um, dermal denticles. And this is from the uh, family. Let me see the uh, the uh, echinorhinoidae, echinorhinoidae, a bramble shark. And this uh, these we were, we found these little fossil features right here. And these are uh, on the skin 
of the of the shark. So they're dermal denticles, and they they don't quite exactly know why they're there. But uh, I gave a presentation in Vancouver about I don't know 15 years ago, and I got asked the question, "What is a dermal denticle, and what are they for?" And I said. I have no idea. <laughs> so anyways, the, the answer is that I did find out later that they, uh, they do allow a certain amount of protection from predators, but mainly it's they, they cause uh, a certain amount of friction when they're swimming through the water and it allows them more maneuverability. Whereas a regular shark, very smooth skin, when it moves, it can't, it can only go one direction straight ahead. It can go sideways, but it's not as maneuverable. And the theory is that with these dermal denticles, they are more maneuverable. So the echino, the echino, uh, echino rhinus teeth are quite large. Um, this is a uh, this is a uh, species, uh, Echinorhinus uh, lapio, and it's, uh, uh, we were able to find some really nice teeth uh, from this species. So here's some of the characteristics. They have uh, uh, a, a fairly sharp cutting edge up here, kind of uh, on, a, on an angle, uh, a little hump, hump along that edge. Um, and they, often, they call those raised spurs. Um, there's one or more nutrient grooves. Now this is the nutrient groove that brings the, the nutrients to the tooth. And that, that's usually right where it is in one or two of them. Um, they have a very thin, this root here is very thin. It's almost paper thin. And the, uh, the enamyloid up here is quite smooth. So these are, these are the characteristics of this tooth. Um, and I hope I'm not boring you too much with all this characteristics, but, <laughs> but anyways, it's just, uh, this is the, 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 the level of detail you have to go to when you're doing a, a paper like this. Um, these are fairly large teeth and they're up to uh, 21 millimeters across. So it's, uh, um, uh, and we did find a fair number of these. Okay, so we're going to move along to the, uh, the dogfish sharks. And uh, I'll just uh, point out this is all the family, is, uh, of course, it's a squalidae. Um, we're all familiar with dog, uh, dogfish, dogfish sharks, correct? Everybody's probably caught one fishing. They usually grow about, you know, up to three or four feet long. And uh, so the, the characteristics of a dogfish are they have the big eye, of course, and dorsal fin, and they have a, another, a two uh, fins on their dorsal area. And uh, the, we found a fair number of uh, squalus teeth. And these squalus teeth were really hard to identify. And so I'm gonna kind of go through these as best I can. Um, so this is uh, uh, Protocentrophorus stevii, stevii, and it's a new species. Now, um, again, when you look at this, you, you go one, we have the mesial cutting edge, two, we have this little uh, deep notch on the root here, and three, we have a, an amyloid uh, labial lobe that hangs down right here. So these are the characteristics that we would look at through the microscope, talk about, and try to debate of what, a, what this uh, um, specimen was. So it's, uh, again, the, the uh, labial and lingual sides are, are different. So you have to check both sides. So that's, uh, again, a new species of uh, shark. 
Now, this is a, one that we didn't have a clue what it was when it, we, we didn't, didn't even know if it was a squalus tooth, but it was. And it's uh, uh, related to the dogfish family, of course. It's a uh, Hesodon uh, wardi, Hesonodon wardi. And um, again, it, it looks like a little, little uh, spade or a little shovel, a little triangular crown. Uh, the uh, enameloid extends right down over the root. Um, and there is a, a basal notch right here. So we, it has great characteristics, but we just didn't know what it was. And lo and behold, it was a, um, a new genus as well as a new species. So that was very exciting. Another squalus tooth, um, Rhinocycumnus clarki. And pardon me with my pronunciation, but these are, are pretty wild names as you can appreciate. Um, anyways, this is a, uh, a new species as well. And uh, again, the characteristics are um, the main cusp is fairly large and uh, triangular, very sharp on the top. And these are very small, by the way, the, the size is like, um, you know, maybe uh, four millimeters by four millimeters or six millimeters, they're very small teeth. Uh, and to, to, to kind of coax these out of the shell, you needed uh, tweezers and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, you have your, your magnification to see what you have. So um, this is, uh, again, another shark's uh, squalus tooth. Uh, the third or fourth one, squaliodelicious. Uh, Savoy, Savoy, and this is a, a named after um, a, a pioneer family on Hornby Island. But again, characteristics of this uh, species are a very huge um, deep basal notch. Easy to tell when you have this, this specimen. Small cusp on top, um, serrated, and uh, these, these uh, thin bi biolabate uh, root blades right here. So it's, uh, again, if you find this now with this paper, we can simply go to the paper and say, yep, that's what that's, that tooth is. So it's really crystal clear when we find a tooth on a hornby. Okay, moving along to another exciting uh, shark's tooth is the uh, Pristophorus, which is a uh, saw shark. And uh, let me just get myself oriented here again. Yeah, Pristophor, Pristophoridae, Pristophoridae. And um, of course, uh, saw sharks are around today and uh, they're usually in the Southern Pacific or the Indian Ocean. Um, they have both rostral teeth and those are for those that don't know what a rostral tooth is, they, they come off their snout here um, and they use that for rooting around in the sand to stir up food. And of course, we also find the oral teeth that inside the, the mouth of the, of the uh, saw shark. So here's some of the characteristics of this uh, species. This is Pristophorus smithi. Again, it's a new species. Um, and uh, some of the characteristics are that the rostral tooth has a distinct um, serrations here. And that uh, is an identifiable feature. It has uh, a prominent, what's called a uh, peduncle, this area right here, which is uh, um, um, a feature that, that uh, we have to identify, as well as it has a, a base, fairly large base. So all these features are, are important to identify. The oral tooth, which is this one right here, uh, is, uh, is got an amyloid on it. It's fairly smooth, it's fairly triangular. Um, and it's well-rounded, it's kind of a roundish tooth. 
Um, and so uh, those are the characteristics of this saw shark oral uh, dentition. Okay, moving along to the nursed shark. And uh, the nurse shark, uh, I'm not going to pronounce that genus because I always get it wrong. So I'm just going to call it a nurse shark. And uh, again, the features are it has a it got two fairly large uh, dorsal fins. It has uh, these little features up here that are called uh, barbells. And they use those to feel out or try to sense their food in the sand type of thing. They have uh, very small teeth and they're um, only three millimeters tall and uh, they have lots of them. So um, I don't know what they would eat, but they probably would eat the small things that they would dig up from the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the ocean floor, such as crabs and things like that. So, um, yeah, the features here, of course, they have a these this these these uh, this larger cusp in the middle with two on each side, and uh, um, and this again is a a, a a genus and species here that I'm not familiar with, and uh, but it is a, a saw, saw shark. Um, the next uh, group of uh, sharks is our uh, sand tiger sharks. And uh, let's go move that a little here. So Odantatuspidae, and that's, uh, we've found a fair number of these sharks. Now these sharks today are more in shallower water um, on the on the kind of the continental shelf versus the deep, deep water. However, we found some of these teeth in the in the uh, uh, deep water as well, so that that maybe tells a story some, somehow about that. So that's uh, interesting. Let me get this right thing. Okay, we got a stuck here. Okay, I'm stuck here. We have some technical difficulties. Can you still see that? Yes, we can see. Um, okay, I'm just, uh, I got a, it paused on me for some reason. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're good. Um, um, sometimes my when you forward it, it, it stops. Yeah, no, we see a, a strange uh, screen. It kind of shows the top view of the menu bar of the PowerPoint. Okay, so, okay, so here we go. Um, so this uh, this sand tiger shark teeth right, here. And we, um, yeah, it's yep. not on. There, huh? It's not on our screen, but there's a little box that says resume slideshow. Okay, uh, let me see here, stop share, um, resume. Does that work? Perfect, we got it. Is that now? Okay, okay, good. So this is a, um, a new species of sand tiger shark, which was uh, again, a new news to me because I hadn't been involved with this until, well, at all since so back in the, in the day. So this is a new species of sand tiger shark. Uh, lots and lots of examples of this. Uh, hundreds of these were found. And uh, it's a Cacarius domingo, which I'm not sure how that's pronounced. It looks like it uh, might be Spanish or something, but uh, or French. So this is uh, uh, was uh, uh, this this uh, for this. Uh, plate here is from this the, the paper. So I've, uh, I've just inserted it to show you the different uh, types of uh, uh, of teeth. 
So they had a primary cusp on these as well as um, two uh, secondary cusplets on the side and a U-shaped uh, root. And of course, you can see they all have the nutrient groove here that takes the food uh, or the nutrients into the, into the tooth to keep it growing. So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, now moving ahead to the uh, to the horned sharks. Now um, I don't know if everybody knows what a horned shark is, but they're apparently they're nicknamed. If I can find it here, the uh, the couch potato of the shark world. <laughs> So they're, they're definitely very slow moving, um, bottom dwelling sharks. And uh, they, uh, um, they have two little protrusions that go off their snout. Uh, the modern ones do, they're still around today. And of course the, uh, the, the uh, and that's all we can go by when we're trying to describe a shark. All we can do is we have the fossil teeth and that's pretty well it. And we know what the teeth are. We compare that with a modern day, for example, horned shark. And we can see that these are in the same uh, family. So that gives us a good example of how to compare. So what you're seeing here is a picture of a, a modern day shark. And uh, here we are with some um, uh, Cynocotus derichii. Again, this is a, some beautiful, beautiful uh, photography on this. Um, these are upper and lower um, teeth. Um, and they're, uh, yeah. So this is uh, uh, what we were calling paraorthocotus. Um, and the, again, the description of these is fairly flat uh, root system here. It's kind of a flat area. Uh, if you look at it from the bottom, uh, it has a primary cusp and secondary cusplets on each side um, and quite, um, quite identifiable. And uh, Cynocotus derichii uh, is, a, is a new species as well. So that's uh, Interesting. So um, this was a, another shark's tooth that we had no clue of what it was. And it wasn't until um, um, Henry Capetta had a look at it. And it is not only a, uh, a new species, it's a new genus, and it's a new family. So it's uh, Florence Sedona Day as a new family uh, uh, that uh, it's been named after, which I believe is uh, Kurt Morrison's mother's name. So this is uh, a kind of a pretty special um, uh, nomenclature for this, for this shark's tooth. Again, it's just a, a fairly nondescript tooth, but it's an enameloid with a fairly flat root. Um, and uh, so it's, it's we had no idea what it was before, and now it's a, been identified. So here's some of the, the images off the paper. And as you can see that it's, uh, they got, looks like they got some pretty good specimens here from the one that we had way back in 25 years ago. So a very small tooth, as you can see, um, but um, beautiful, exquisite photography here and detail, nutrient groove here, the cusp and the secondary cusplets um, and the root being what it is. So um, yeah, they're not even sure uh, exactly what, um, if it's a, a carcara form or not. So it's, it's interesting. So in summary of, of this shark's tooth paper, as well as, uh, the previous work over the last 25 years, uh, they, they, the summary is that the Hornby Island fauna consists basically of 30 different species of shark. 
belonging to 26 genera. There's 17 new species. There's seven new genera and two new families. Um, the Comoxodontidae and the Florencio Dontidae, uh, the one named after the, the Comox First Nations and the one named after uh, Kurt's mother. So that's the uh, summary of the presentation. And uh, um, any questions? 